who live in a world without money. You're an architect that wants to buy a house. First, you need to find a bunch of business individuals who require some sort of modeling services from an architect. And if these workers don't want architectural services and prefer being paid in something else like flat screen TVs, then you're gonna have to find TV manufacturers that have two things. Try posting that on Craigslist. This is what you call the barter system. It takes a lot of time and energy. A system of exchange in which participants in a transaction directly exchange goods and services for other goods and services without using a medium of exchange, such as money. To this day, people still barter stuff. But for a majority of transactions, we use money, which is globally preferred by business entities or individuals. The people who really need dental care will pay you with money, which you can now use to buy a car. Economic analysts state that money has three main services of use. Starting off, it's used as a medium of exchange. It's globally accepted as a currency for exchange and is used to validate purchases and the exchange of goods. Now, that medium of exchange means we're not stuck in the barter system. Next, money is considered as a store of value. There's a reason why cars aren't paid for with fruits in return. Plus, bananas go bad pretty quickly in a safety deposit box. Money serves the purpose of a unit of account. We don't measure the value of cars and bananas, muffins, or root canals. Money is a standard metric that allows us to measure the relative value of things. A lot of people assume money is just coins and cash. Coins have been used for thousands of years, and they're a great example of money. But technically, money is anything that's used as a medium of exchange. For example, cigarettes were used as money in prisons until smoking bans were put in place. Nowadays, prisoners use cigarettes and even small packets of noodles as currency. Animals, furniture, or anything that holds value that can be traded serves the purpose of monetary value or money. Some of the weirdest mediums of exchange include Raystone, which was a currency used by indigenous people on Yap Island in the Pacific Ocean. Squirrel pelts is another form of currency that is used in medieval Russia, or was used. So common, in fact, that snouts, claws, and even ears were used, presumably as change. The point is, what economics are trying to make here is that anything is considered money as long as it's a medium of exchange, and that's changed a lot over time. Cash and coins are commonly used for monetary purposes today because they are convenient to carry, physically durable, and difficult to counterfeit. However, a large portion of today's money does not end up in anyone's pocket, wallet, or duffel bag. It instead travels around the world in an electric fashion. People are increasingly receiving payment in the form of checks and direct transfers into their bank accounts. We have a lot of money that isn't physically present. It's all done digitally. Bitcoin is another type of digital currency that you may have heard about. Bitcoin is a decentralized virtual money that is neither issued or regulated by any government. Many economists continue and consider it money because some individuals accept it as payment. Bitcoin, unlike other electronic currencies, does not require the use of a bank, allowing users to buy products more anonymously in principle. People who don't trust central banks as well as those who wish to buy legal goods online will find this currency very appealing. Because of this unlawful commerce, law enforcement and authorities are also keen on Bitcoin. Bitcoin, on the other hand, isn't just for online drug sales. A lot of people usually also buy Bitcoins in the hopes of making a profit, which means Bitcoin is subject to a lot of speculation. This turns Bitcoin into a more speculative asset, limiting its usage in, in the purchase and sale of physical goods and services. Could Bitcoin or another virtual currency become a standard method of payment in the future? Who knows what will happen, but if anyone wants to buy this loaf of bread for 3 Bitcoins for me, let me know. But here's a question for you. What actually makes these pieces of green paper so valuable? Previously, each dollar created by the United States government could be exchanged for a particular amount of gold. The gold standard stipulated that the government could not print more money than it had in gold reserves. When the United States decided to abandon the gold standard in the 1930s, 
Many were alarmed by the prospects of not having something substantial to support the dollar. But it's vital to remember that money is all about confidence, whether it's cash, gold, or bananas. However, with this in mind, a gold standard or even mackerel standard may not increase its value or reliability of money. These pieces of green paper have value because everyone thinks they have value, as said by the Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman. Several analysts make the same claim and agree with the statement, which is the core reason why the gold standard is in no use anymore. To this day, there's still a minority of people that would like to bring it back, but it's most likely never happening. Okay, let me give you an introduction to what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about the financial system. I'm sure you hear about the stock market when finance is being discussed, but there's much more depth to it. The stock market is just one piece of something much bigger, the financial system. To understand the financial system, you need to put two different groups together. To start off with, we have the category of people we call lenders. These people are groups of people or corporations such as banks, etc. that hold excessive cash to lend to the public which they expect to be paid back along with an additional portion of money we call interest. The next group of people is what we call borrowers. Everyone needs money at some point, whether to buy a house, car, or going on vacation to Cancun. You may want to start a business. You may have a good idea, but lack the capital to the start. Then we have the governments who borrow money and they do that so they don't have to increase taxes to increase cash flow. The annual amount the government borrows is known as the budget deficit. The total amount the government has borrowed is known as the national debt or the public sector debt. It's pretty clear now that we have different groups of categories of people that play a different role in the financial system. We have lenders who hold reserves of money and use that to make more money. And you have borrowers who hold the money temporarily to essentially pay it back in set time. A financial system is an economic arrangement wherein financial institutions facilitate the transfer of funds and assets between borrowers, lenders and investors. Its goal is to efficiently distribute economic resources to promote economic growth and generate a return on investment, or better known as ROI, for the market participants. There are three ways this exchange takes place. The first is banks. A lender deposits money in the bank. And then the bank turns around and loans that money to a family who wants to buy a house or a business that wants to expand. As those borrowers pay interest on their loans, the bank takes a part of that money to cover their costs and passes those along the rest to the depositor. The second way lenders and borrowers link up is through the bond market. The government or a large corporation that needs to borrow money will sell bonds to lenders. A bond is essentially an IOU in which the borrower commits to pay periodic interest payments while also promising to repay the entire amount at a future date. If a lender decides they'd rather have cash now, they can sell the bond to someone else. Another way for borrowers and lenders to link up is through the stock market. For example, me and Patricia are planning to expand our current orange juice business, but we don't have the money to do so. We could sell stock, which is essentially a piece of a company's ownership. The stock is distributed to households and the cash is distributed to us. If our company makes money in the future and we become orange juice moguls, we will share some of our earnings with the shareholders, or they could sell their share for a greater price. They make money in either case if the company is profitable. So there's a connection between banks and bonds. They're dealing with a concept known as debt. If you take out a bank loan or a government issuer sells a bond, the amount you must repay is predetermined. In virtually all circumstances, you will be required to repay the amount borrowed plus a specific amount of interest. Stocks on the other hand are known as equity. Shareholders gain more money if a company makes a lot of profit. Shareholders may receive nothing if a company goes bankrupt. Stock market fluctuations are not reliable indicators of the state of the economy. Frequently, stock market fluctuations are reactions to real or perceived changes in economic fundamentals such as consumer confidence, unemployment, and GDP growth. 
Bonds and stocks share several characteristics. They're traded on markets for financial instruments. Bonds are debt instruments, which while stocks are equity instruments. Yet both pieces of paper traded on the markets with a large number of buyers and sellers. Banks on the other hand are entities that deal with money. They protect our money while giving loans to individuals and businesses with the support of the FDIC. So why do we need such a convoluted financial system in the first place? Why don't individuals take their savings and lend them straight to the others? You can. However, it's somewhat risky. So you're more likely to rely on a financial system. Borrowers can crowdsource the money they need to borrow using financial markets and products like stocks and bonds. They raise money from a large number of investors and distribute the risk. The same thing is done by banks. They amass tiny deposits from tens and thousands of people and use those funds to create loans. A financial system from the lender's perspective allows you to spread your savings among dozens of hundreds of loans. A few businesses may fail, but those losses will be compensated by workers and borrowers who repay their loans. It's never a good idea to put all your eggs in the same basket. So that's how the financial system works. It's important to realize that this isn't merely a concept of someone else's problem. Almost everyone has been a lender or a borrower at some point in their lives. Therefore, grasping the concepts of lending and borrowing is crucial. That's all for our first lecture. Hope you learned a thing or two during this video. Make sure to also like, subscribe, and share the video to help our channel out. Goodbye for now.